Okay, uh, last chapter I was in uh, Long Bay Jail, I think, yeah. And my beatnik pals didn't even know my name. So nobody came to visit me. Uh, there's nothing you can do when someone's in... Well, these days you can give them money and all sorts of stuff, but in the old days you couldn't bring stuff in for them uh, or give them money because there, there, no one was allowed to buy stuff in 66, not like these days when you can buy stuff if you've got money. So after a month at Long Bay, I was transferred to Bathurst Jail where we also had single cells. I loved having a single cell, didn't worry me. It was just like having a room in a hotel. I didn't care. I was given a job as a sweeper. They're, they're the guys that uh, polish the floors of the wing with big giant dolly brooms and four floor wax. They would built up my muscles a tiny bit, but, you know, my muscles don't build up very much. And when the Bathurst Crims heard that I drank at the Royal George, they knew it was a hippie pub, so they named me Beatnik. And they were fascinated... Uh, they were fascinated uh, by Beatnik free love. So I bullshitted that uh, I'll get you... a. Uh, date with a beatnik chick when you get out which is the last thing I'd ever want to do I didn't want to ever see one of them again they're all fucking idiots <laughs> well I was an idiot too but you know I wasn't as idiot as them most of them and that kept me slightly free from aggression of days in the prison yards. It was a hard place, full of real crims. Everybody smoked. It was our only luxury, except for a weekly movie projected on the wall of the chapel. If the, gov if the government hadn't allowed us two ounces of tobacco every week, the riots of 70 and 74 would have happened in 66. I never trusted anyone. Um, if anyone tried being a pal, I'd clam up and think he was after my bum or my tobacco. And eventually my time was up and I, my four months, was hand, I was handed a train ticket to Sydney and about $37. Uh, well, these days it might be 350 or something. I don't know what it is these days, but back then it was 37 bucks in 66. At Central Station, I bought a wonderful milkshake. Because we never got milk in jail except uh, in our porridge. And that was already in your porridge when you first got it. So no one got milk in 66. So I was real happy to get a milkshake. So then I headed for the Royal George. Now I want to give a special mention to the Royal George. It's, a, it's a, at 10 o'clock it wakes up because that's when it opens. And all the hungover people from the night before, the alcoholics come in and hide in its back room because there was a room out the back with tables in it. I'll try and find a photo of it later. <clears throat> and then the lonely come in, like I was at first, and they come sauntering in, sort of trying to appear as if they belong. But, you know, you can tell, you can tell who they are. They are the pub's favourite clientele, actually, but they don't yet know it. And about midday, Mrs G, who runs the place, she must be, I think she was the owner, the owner family that owned it or, or had the licensee. She flogs her counter lunches and hungry dock workers come in because dock workers... Uh, came in every lunchtime because the Royal George was right next to the docks. So the bar was full of dock workers buying beer and Miller's beer. Miller's Dark was the favourite beer of the joint. And there were no chips or peanuts much because they wouldn't have lasted long on little dishes on the table like some pubs. But any free food that like peanuts that was put out on the table would soon get scrumped up because... <laughs> There was a pretty hungry lot at the Royal George. I look back on it now as a bloody heaven, you know, because there's no pubs like that anymore. So around about 1pm, genuine old hippie types start coming in 
and girls with long hair and around two o'clock they're starting to assemble and they eye, they eye newcomers like gunfighters in a western. But the beer keeps flowing and by two o'clock everybody starts to mingle. Now, you leave the bar and you go through a connecting door and into the passageway. The bar noise behind us diminishes. There's the inner sanctum, the back room. That's where the big, long tables are. Four, I think, four big, long, oval-shaped tables. And there were men are conversing. See, there, there was mostly men in that pub. About 8% might have been women, but it was a pretty manly sort of pub. But women were very welcome there too and were treated equal long before women's lib. Well, in a way, they were treated equal. They were always sexified a little bit, but a lot less than other pubs. So who's here, someone says, oh, nobody of any note, says someone else. They're always, they're always saying, oh, nothing's happening, you know. You seen Les Robinson today, someone says? Oh, he's got a job at Garden Island. Oh, the poor bugger. No, no, it's a grouse job. He's a tally clerk. Oh, what a bludge. Half his luck. What about that young chick he's got? And then conversations grow until the room buzzes with laughter and arguments. And you walk north, four paces north, and enter the saloon bar. There are small tables in there where you chat up a lover, if you got a chance to. And the drinks cost a few pence more, but you can connect with shakers and movers if you're inclined. Libertarians, and there's a club called the Libertarians Club that meets there on Tuesdays to discuss and pursue all sorts of subjects they love to talk. And there's a bloke who looks like Russell Morris and Martin Sharp and a, and a guy who writes for that new satirical magazine, Oz, O-Z, it's, it's pronounced Oz, but I didn't think it was as good as Mad. Mad was much better than Aussie satire. People always arguing with me about that, but, you know, Mad's on another level. <laughs> but Oz was pretty good, OZ. And some days, if weak with hunger, Dutch Andy, Johnny Bates and I roam around holding out empty pie plates and begging. Small change, please. Please feed the starving beatnik. Not many gave because coins were pretty scarce at the Royal George. They were used mainly for buying drinks. But, you know, now and again we'd get a 20 cents or 50 cents or a dollar, just enough to buy uh, salty potato scallops from the next door fish shop. We ate a hell of a lot of salty potato scallops. And at three o'clock, a long-haired blonde called Scunge feeds two shilling coins into the public bar jukebox slot. It was 10 cents a song, but if you put 40 cents in, you'd get five songs. Now, the most popular songs at the George were Satisfaction by the Stones and Out of Time by the Stones, and the House of the Rising Sun, and Dylan's Rainy Day Women, and Gates of Eden, and Subterranean Homesick Blues. <clears throat> and the volume was always a bit low, so it was hard to hear if you wanted to uh, hear a song, and Johnny Bates used to say, Turn up the volume, Mrs G! And Mrs G would always yell back, Go and wash your bloody ears out and you might hear. At five o'clock, a few dozen hippies, or well, half a dozen hippies arrive by taxi and they jokingly demand service immediately for instant service. But they're only joking. And I notice a middle-aged man sitting by the window looking lonely. <clears throat> so I sit beside him and smile, hoping that he'll shout me a drink. Later, if he gets a bit drunk, you know, I may get the chance to sneak a few dollars or quid. 66, yeah, it would have been dollars by then. A few of us considered the George our home. If we had to sleep rough, the pub was where we could wash a shirt in the Dunny wash basin. 
The pub had no security guards. If anyone ever got barred from the joint, old Mrs G would make sure they never got back in. Johnny Bates managed to reach over the bar once and steal a bottle of spirits. I think he did that three times in four years. He must have been mighty desperate because to risk being barred from the George would have broke his heart. Now, Phil Bryden Brown, the hyphenated beatnik, his surname was Bryden hyphen Brown. He looked like Lee Marvin and he loved a drunken brawl. He was often barred by Mrs G, but only for a day, and then he'd worm forgiveness from her. But when he was barred, we used to walk with, I used to, I used to hang around with him a lot because, you know, he, when he was, when he had money, he, he'd buy drinks for everybody. Uh, <clears throat> but when he was barred from the George, we'd walk down to the bunch of cunts. That was a dimly lit wine bar, 600 metres north of King and Sussex. It was known as the Buncher. It was full of the wildest, fightingest bums I'd ever seen in one place. It scared me a bit, so I only went in with Phil. Old dames at the Buncher loved Phil's good looks and cavalier attitude. A lot of dames did. He seduced my chick Leslie a few years later, so I tried to shoot him with me bow and arrow, but not fatally. I deliberately did name. I just let fly in his general direction. But that story comes in 10 years from now. The arrow stuck in the door uh, and it missed his leg by 100 centimetres. <laughs> and he was so drunk that he didn't even notice it. So I even got to walk over and get my arrow back. In the buncher, I always expected a headbutt from some nutcase. Seafarers uh, from the nearby docks uh, came a lot to Sussex Street pubs. They'd either pick a fight or take us back to their ship to drink. <clears throat> At night, in the summer heat, if bored or if the bludgeon was poor, we'd walk a few miles, a few blocks south to check other hippie pubs. Well, they weren't hippie pubs, but they were sort of bohemian a tiny bit. The Criterion, uh, journalists and intellectuals drank at the Criterion. So I never went there much, but it, the United States Hotel was where Graham the Buddhist hung out. So I'd drop in there on the hope that he was there because he worked at the ABC and threw parties every Friday. And he liked that I was nuts about Zen Buddhism, because he was too. So he'd always invite me to his parties. Uh, the Sussex Hotel was for Sydney's emerging lesbians. Uh, we were tolerated there, us beatnik types were tolerated there, as long as we didn't try to pick up any girls. I had hippie friends, but no one <coughs> with shareable accommodation. It was too cold to sleep in my rush cutter bay tennis shed, so I moved to an abandoned car. And I used to sleep in Green Park. Uh, there, uh, around the, Green Park was a homosexual pickup joint, but I didn't know that. I used to sleep on a bench there opposite uh, St Vincent's Hospital. Uh, but no one ever tried to chat me up. Maybe I looked too tough. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, fuck. Across the road, a door opened one morning and I saw Kay Benz. Kay Benz was a, a girl from the Royal George and she came out to gather a bottle of milk from her doorstep and I noticed, I'd noticed i noticed her black hair and a cheeky smile at the George and I sensed that she was lonely a bit. And I yelled, hey, howdy! And she motioned me <coughs> to come upstairs and warm myself at a tiny radiator. Uh, art equipment was scattered on every service, and Kay lit a gas ring to boil a saucepan or coffee, and we chatted about acquaintances, and I let her know I kind of liked her a lot. And she was a little embarrassed and told me the kind of women she was attracted to. So I made like I knew that she was gay all along, and we talked about art, and she tried teaching me to draw faces, but I was not very good at it. And we said goodbye, and I headed for the George. 
the Royal George. So in William Street, I ran into Johnny Bates and Dutch Andy and Phil Brighton Brown. The four of us were pretty much a group, and I was the only one of them that didn't drink much. But I liked hanging around with them because when they had money, they shared it. And uh, I don't know where they got their money because I don't think they were on the dole because it was very hard to get the dole back then because it sent you straight to a job the minute that you applied for it. <clears throat> so I tagged along with those three and we shared two pints of beer between us. And Bates told me that well-respected hippie's identity, Martin Allen and his stunning girlfriend, Eula, had just rented a Surrey Hills terrace house. And Dutch, uh, Dutch Andy's eyes sparkled like Salvador Dali, and he said, let's get over there and crash on their floor. And Johnny Bates, I told you before, he looked like a boxer who'd lost a lot of fights. He peered into the mysterious bottom of his beer glass and he muttered, let's get there before someone else does. They might have Tucker in the fridge. And uh, Phil drained his beer and burped ruefully and stood to stretch his six foot two inch frame. He had a blonde crew cut and he led us out of the pub proclaiming, lead us through the alley of the cross and we will fear no fucking evil. And he pu pulled me close to him and he said, because we are the fucking evil, aren't we, Casper, you psychopathic cunt? Keep your eyes peeled for coppers, Bates. And uh, like the Beatles on that album, we strode across William Street without waiting for the lights and Johnny flirted with, Johnny Bates flirted with girls we passed, and Dutch Andy imitated Hitler and Sig Heiled everybody. And uh, he was hard to manage. We tried to stop him, Sig Heiling at some people, but he was very hard to manage. And at Oxford Street, we popped into the Beecham Hotel, but no one we knew was there. And Dutch Andy moaned it aloud in his extreme accent. He said, 11 o'clock! And all is not well. I am having need for beer. I am Dutchman from the Zyder Zee in minor kleiner wooden clogs. And I demand your Australian swine hunt curs buy me much of your stinking second rate Aussie beer. He was trying to get a laugh, but no one got the joke but us. And then he said, Spine hounds of pig dogs. You will tell us everything you know. And for two minutes he raved on Nazi war movie dialogue. And by the time we got to Martin and Euler's, we could hardly walk for laughing. Ah, uh, I don't know if that's a good chapter or not. It doesn't matter anyway. I'm just putting it up now to get rid of it. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's very hard to pick out the good bits and the bad bits. Okay, that's all for now.